Yeah, my name is Dermot Turing. Um, I'm Alan Turing's nephew, and I've just completed a book called The Story of Computing. The thing that was quite intriguing about writing the story of computing was that it was not the story of computers. And there have been several books out there about computers and the history of computers. But I think computing is, is a bit bigger and it's a bit more interesting than that. And, and that's what intrigued me about it. Um, stories of computers can be a bit dull, frankly. They can be stories about sort of engineering or what's in a sort of rather boring looking rectangular steel box and uh, I thought that actually the story of computing which is what goes on inside the box what makes uh, a machine into something that can do all these amazing things that's much more intriguing than than the sort of how we went from very large boxes to very small ones. Um, I mean, that's part of the story. I don't want to diminish the engineering achievements, but it, it seemed that the bigger, broader picture could be much more fun. Um, well, I'd known that um, some of the story of computing and the way that um, people had thought about uh, use of machines to uh, help with problem solving, if you like, was, was a very ancient one. Uh, I, I think while I sort of vaguely knew that as a concept, um, what, what was quite fun was actually discovering how early in history people had actually used machinery to help with all, all sorts of problem solving, not, not just, uh, if you like, arithmetical problems, not just calculations, but they were doing all sorts of other things. And uh, the most obvious example, I mean, we all confront them every day. Everybody's got a clock in their house, and nobody thinks of a clock as being a computer. But the clock doesn't measure the time. What the clock does is it computes the time for you, and it gives you its, its um, idea of what the time is, which is why clocks run fast and clocks run slow. And... I'd never thought of clocks as being computers before I started realizing that what computing is about, it's about problem solving. It's about finding, uh, if you like, a, a synthetic and artificial way of, um, of trying to uh, get, get to a particular solution and, and you know, working out what time it is. You can look at the sun, which will tell you the exact thing, but that's very complicated to measure. Or you can have a clock that will calculate it for you. It might get it slightly wrong, but, it, but it's very clever. And I thought, my goodness, we've been doing computing for centuries. Just every village has a clock. <laughs> and it's got a computer in the middle of the village. I never thought about it that way before. It's really interesting. One of the things that happens during wartime is it's a great boost to inventiveness. And I think one of the things they realized very quickly in the code breaking operations at Bletchley Park was that they were going to need assistance from machinery, electromechanical machinery to begin with, to help crank through routinely crank through very very large numbers of very dull uh it's effectively a sifting operation it's trying to find a needle in a haystack and it's much easier to get a machine to do that accurately uh whereas of course humans have got very limited concentration span and, and find these kinds of routine attention to detail tasks extremely hard um, so machinery was obviously the answer for these guys back in 1939 1940 but as the computing problems associated with code breaking got more complex as the war developed that provided a real spur to the development of more advanced machinery and so they started moving from the electromechanical technology into electronic technology started using uh, the predecessors of transistors things look look a bit like light bulbs but uh, they were called electronic valves because they effectively had switching 
system in them. And these things operated at the speed of light, so they sped up the computing that was being done for code breaking massively. So that by 1945, they've got a huge machine at Bletchley Park, which they called Colossus. It had hundreds and hundreds of these valves in it, but it was able to do so much more than just a single purpose code breaking task. It was able to, well, the mathematicians got hold of this thing and started programming it to do long multiplication. And you're thinking, well, that's amazing. They've actually started using the concept of programming um, this, this vast machine. So it was in that whole code breaking environment that the uh, essentially the foundation stone for the post-war development of electronic programmable computers. That's where it was laid. One of the things I discovered when I was doing my research was that the history of computers, because it's typically a history of technology and what happens in steel boxes, has been something that's fascinated men, and therefore typically the histories of computers have been written by men. Unfortunately, I've just realized I've completely disqualified myself from saying anything further about this because I'm also a man, so I probably fall straight into that, that, that category of people. But one of the things that I discovered was that there was a whole piece that was really not being written about, which is the history of programming and the history of software. And there's very little written about that. and oh, this is fascinating because that story is much more about women. And somehow they've been sidelined because the story's always been about the technology, which was driven by the men. The people who used it, the people who had to set the machines to work, the people who were responsible for their day-to-day -day operation, the people who wrote the programs, the people who devised the software, these were all women. And that, that was absolutely remarkable to me. Um, I didn't know anything about that because somehow they'd been written out of the narrative before. So um, this has been great because this has been, I mean, not only a very interesting sort of discovery to find out who these women were that were involved in things, but also trying to understand why they were written out of history as well. This is, this is really hard because the story of computing is full of innovations, but I think one of the things that has struck me, and, it, and it's probably the thing that immediately occurs to people, there's been an explosion in computing in the last 30 years, but I think that this is because of a fusion between um, various things. We've, we've had amazing developments in technology, but what we've also discovered is that we've... Um, made that much more powerful by marrying the technology to the idea of communications. And so once you put the uh, idea of a computer as a communications device as well as a calculation device uh, together, then what that has spawned is things like the internet, it spawned social media, it spawned the uh, ability to do things that we now take for granted but weren't it weren't around 25 years ago like uh, like you know, just some simple thing like email and messaging you know the ability to communicate uh, um, and and that that marriage seems to me to have been the most most incredible thing I mean it's it's what's made uh, us utterly dependent on uh, on our phones and on our computers these days I think one thing that the UK government and probably other governments have recognised is that we have a digital skills gap. We uh, have rather belatedly woken up to the idea that the way that computing was being taught in schools for many years was about being taught how to use a computer uh, rather than how to make a computer or you know create software or or to do coding or uh to be inventive about things and that to me is just a reflection of the fact that the a more senior generation of government officials and teachers didn't know how to use computers and recognize that as a skills gap for themselves and decided they ought to um, make sure the next generation of kids 
didn't have that problem. But that was such a superficial approach to things. If you went back another generation before that, then kids in schools were actually being uh, encouraged to think about computer programming. Uh, um, but it was something where it was expected that scientists in particular would need to use computers as part of their work. And in those days, people hadn't invented software packages. So you would have to write your own program. So it was kind of a functional necessity. I think we've perhaps come full circle and gone back to that point where we've realized that because we're so utterly dependent on computers, that having a small elite of specialist professionals who can help with the coding is as a recipe for failure. We've got to have a much, much bigger group of people who can do it. So I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to have these skills, but I think it's going to be similar to having language skills. Not everybody needs to have language skills, but you need to have lots of people with language skills because otherwise you cut yourself off from the rest of the world. Artificial intelligence is somehow a very sensitive subject and I, and I guess people uh, are perhaps a little bit alarmed about it because they can see things like uh, facial recognition software being rolled out. I mean, there was a story on the news just last night about the Metropolitan Police in London using facial recognition software just uh, picking up everybody walking up the street and, and people are wondering about that as being sort of invasions of privacy and then people perhaps fear that artificial intelligences might take over the planet. And here we get into a tricky area because for, well, ever since Alan Turing first started talking about intelligent machinery back in the late 1940s, people have been tempted to confuse the idea of robots and the idea of artificial intelligence. And that instantly conjures up a sort of science fiction movie type of uh, idea of robots taking over the planet. And I think that's very dangerous because what that does is it encourages people to trivialize the discussion about whether there should be ethical boundaries around artificial intelligence. So, I mean, for example, again, just to go back to sort of Alan Turing and his contemporaries, one of it, Alan Turing's colleagues at Bletchley Park, a professor called I.J. Good, says in about 1962 that it was quite likely that at some point we would create a super intelligent piece of software and that that super intelligent piece of software, meaning that something that is far more intelligent than human beings, would be the last invention we need make because it would then take over the whole process of invention. And that's interesting and it's also slightly worrying because if that is possible, um, and I don't think we're there yet, but if that is possible then we need to think about how we might try and control that. But the trouble is if you talk to people who are active in the artificial intelligence research area, then they're quite likely to say, no, 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 you watch too many science fiction movies and you think the robots are going to take over the planet and I'll tell you that the simple research project that I'm involved in is very narrow and couldn't possibly be like that, so stop worrying about it. Uh, and this is where I think that the robot fallacy trips us up and gets in the way because it means that we're not having the debates that we perhaps should be having the debate having before it's too late. <laughs>